Welcome to this week's episode of Send Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our topic is autism community and law enforcement. And our special guest is Commander uh, Robert Moser of the San Francisco Police Department. Will, before we begin, we always ask you about your shirt. Tell us about your shirt today. I'm glad you asked, Keith. This week's shirt is my is is one of, is my USF Don shirt. It represents the Dons from USF, and I go to all their sporting events, including volleyball, soccer, and basketball games. Very very good. And I understand Officer Moser is uh, an old Don too. I am. I, I like that shirt very much. I, I am a graduate uh, of USF, and I am a fellow Don as well. Excellent, excellent. Will, would you like to begin? Certainly, Keith. Officer Moser, Officer Moser, tell us about your background in police work. When did you enter the force? What is your current position? Oh, well, um, I have been a police officer here in San Francisco for over 20 years. I joined in uh, January of 1995. Um, I've worked several uh, in, in several different positions throughout the police department. I have worked at district stations uh, throughout most of the downtown city. Um, I was a supervisor at Tenderloin Station. I was a field training officer where I trained new recruits. I was the coordinator of the field training program at Tenderloin Station. Uh, I was a lieutenant in the North Beach area. I have served as the head of our internal affairs division uh, as a lieutenant where I was in charge of investigating allegations of misconduct against police officers. Uh, I was a captain of Mission Station. Uh, I've served as the commander of investigations, um, overseeing investigations throughout the city. And currently, I'm the commander of Metro Division, which oversees uh, the downtown, five of the downtown stations, uh, which include Central, Southern, Northern, Tenderloin, and Mission Stations. Tell us about the San Francisco Police Department's approach to community relations. Uh, community relations are a huge part of what we do. Uh, it's crucial to have good community relations for us to do our jobs most effectively. And how we do that is through a variety of different eff efforts. Uh, starting with the police academy and the recruits, uh, the recruits start, we start off early with immersion programs within particular communities where the recruits go out and they actually meet individuals uh, in those communities uh, throughout the city. They also volunteer uh, at different events, community events throughout the city. Uh, they work with children uh, throughout the city. And then that ex uh, expands when they become uh, full-time officers in the different community uh, relations um, efforts that the, the police department has. Um, such as uh, working with youth groups. Uh, Chief Greg Sir has been um, very, very good and it has been his message uh, regarding working uh, with youth uh, from the beginning, um, be that through jobs programs, be that through uh, working with uh, children um, at uh, youth programs, gymnasiums, so on and so forth. Um, we really want to try to further that connection with the community. I understand that the department might be and do, might be doing. Uh, uh, I understand that the de that the department might be doing additional training reg regarding autism. Could you describe? Sure. Well, um, right now we have a, a crisis intervention team. Uh, the the crisis intervention team uh, was established uh, through a police commission resolution in two thousand and eleven. Um, since that uh, establishment of the formal crisis intervention team, we've trained 350 officers um, in basically um, crisis intervention, de-escalation techniques, um, basically creating time and distance when you uh, become involved in a crisis situation. As a component of that crisis intervention team, we do have a component that talks about individuals with uh, developmental disabilities um, and how to interact, um, signs of individuals that, that have uh, developmental disabilities, um, and specifically there's a section on individuals with autism. Um, as part of that ongoing training, we conduct three to four classes a year 
Um, right now, we are training all of our academy recruits in crisis intervention. So every new officer that goes out on the street is going to be trained in crisis intervention. Uh, we are now also working towards making sure all of their trainers are up to speed and trained as well in crisis intervention. Um, and in addition, we're exploring additional training regarding um, interactions with individuals that are on the autism spectrum. Um, and we're trying to determine what the best, best method is in getting that message out. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing now and some of the things that we're looking forward to in the future. Very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the uh, crisis intervention uh, program involves, both in general and sure. how it might be uh, dealing with people in the autistic community? So the crisis intervention team was developed uh, specifically to give officers extra training um, when, when uh, encountering uh, situations of individuals who are in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and that can, individuals in crisis could, um, that involves a wide spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it could involve uh, individuals that are in some sort of mental crisis. Um, it has a, a portion on uh, individuals and, and, no, and understanding um, individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, and it's really meant towards giving officers those extra skills to recognize when somebody's um, in crisis and also giving them techniques in creating time mm -hmm. and distance, trying to slow down a situation when it's safe to do so um, and when, that's, when that makes it safe for everybody involved, the person in crisis, um, bystanders, officers, so on and so forth, and then attempting to de-escalate the situation when it is safe to do so. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is to get as many officers trained out there uh, on the streets when uh, when they have um, the, the officers that are out, out on the streets that have the, the potential to, to be come into these contacts as possible. And that's why um, we've moved towards a model of now trying to train all the new recruits that are coming out, or actually we are training all the new recruits that are coming out, um, as well as their trainers, in addition to the 350 or so officers that we have trained already. Very interesting. Um, is there really any uh, difference in the training that the officers receive between, say, here's an individual who, per se, uh, might be mentally ill, another one might be developmentally uh, disabled, a third might be autistic, a fourth might uh, sure. be under the influence of drugs or alcohol? The, yes, they, they try to make that, uh, to differentiate mm -hmm. between, between those, um, those people in those individual categories. Um, and but the, really, the, that message is again trying to create that time and distance, trying mm -hmm. to slow things down when you can, trying to um, use your de-escalation techniques. Of course, when it is safe, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's always about safety, and it's always about safety for the individual who's in crisis, um, people that might be bystanders, and the officer as well. Um, that's really what it's working towards, and. Um, the idea of doing additional training would be more t geared towards uh, individuals that who are on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and identification and interaction with them. Mm. One of the things that our community is very interested in learning, uh, Commander Moser, is how they should uh, react when encountering uh, police. That's a great uh, question, Keith. Uh, well, first of all, a police contact can produce a lot of an anxiety. Uh, that uh, being said, it's important to try to remain as calm as possible. Um, when an officer would encounter you, one of, one of the big things um, regarding officers um, and their safety levels is having someone try to, as much as possible, remain in the area that they're, that they're first encountered. So try to avoid walking away mm -hmm. from the officer um, as much as possible. Uh, if an officer asks uh, you to sit down, try to remain seated as much as possible. The anxiety level can increase when somebody stands up because we have to remember um, in uh, encounters, officers are often working on very limited information. It's their interaction and questioning mm -hmm. um, that allows them to determine what this, what's going on in a situation. So when they first encounter an individual, they really don't have a lot of information. Um, they don't know whether or not the, the individual is in fact a, a suspect of a crime um, or what their intentions are. 
Um, so standing up, moving, um, if an officer tells you to stand in a certain area or sitting down and you do um, something that's contrary to that could mm-hmm. produce a little bit of anxiety and the officer would, be, would wonder, why is this person doing that? So that would be uh, number one. Number two is uh, if, uh, when possible, if you could explain to the officer uh, that you have autism or produce a card, uh, if you have a card uh, that explains your situation. The one thing I want to um, uh, be very clear about is that, that if you are you do have a card and you're going to retrieve it it's very important that you tell the officer I have a card in my pocket mm-hmm. that explains my situation I would like to show it to you and then when the officer says okay let go ahead and, and retrieve it then you can retrieve it um, an officer uh, otherwise an officer would not understand fully or may not understand mm-hmm. fully why you're reaching into a pocket Pockets often contain weapons uh, that obviously would make uh, would make an officer uh, nervous. Um, the other thing to remember is, an, under limited circumstances, um, an officer may uh, do what's called a pat search mm-hmm. for weapons. Now, that obviously uh, can produce quite a bit of anxiety, but. The way a pat search works is if an officer was going to, a, let's say, a scenario where an officer was responding to a call of a person with a weapon, uh, the individual they stopped matched that description, and they felt that the person might have that weapon. What the officer would do would, would do what's called a pat search. It's a, a light touching of the clothing mm-hmm. just to determine that if there is or is not the presence of a weapon. Um, it's important to know what that is and why the officer would be doing that because obviously something like that where, where an officer all of a sudden is touching the clothing of a person, that can produce a lot of anxiety. So it's important to understand what that is and, and why, officers, uh, why officers would do that. Obviously, um, if uh, an individual was in the presence of a, an advocate or a caretaker, mm-hmm. that's huge in, in helping um, explain the situation. Um, and, and pointing out to the officer, uh, I have a friend who can explain who's over there or a caretaker, wh- whomever it might be. That would be a, that would be a big part in, in assisting the officer um, in helping out. And, it, and it's important to, to, to explain that to the officer and then, and then get the officers okay to have that person come over and, yes. and begin speaking. Um, if, uh, if, you're under uh, under the age of 18. It's important to tell the officer, I'm 17 years old or I'm 16 years old, because that um, uh, basically we have we have different protocols for uh, juvenile um, individuals. So it's important for the officer mm-hmm. to know that. Um, if for some reason um, you were detained and, and brought to a, a police facility, um, just remember as a juvenile, a juvenile would always have a, uh, the right to a phone call um, within an hour. And it's important to let, uh, why, the other reason why it's important to let officers know that you're a juvenile because the officer has to call the, the parents uh, mm-hmm. of the juvenile, which is very important because the parent can explain to the officer what the situation is and that, that'll be a big help. The more information that an officer gets, the, the, bigger, the bigger help it is. Um, regarding phone calls, if, uh, if you were an adult, uh, you receive three phone calls within, within three hours. Um, normally, uh, a police contact, uh, reg- obviously it starts in the, in the street, right, or in the yes. field, okay? Um, sometimes that could transition to a, a police station. Uh, it's just important to know that um, not necessarily if, if you're br- being brought to the police station, it doesn't necessarily mean you're being arrested. You could be released from there. Um, it's it could be a transition transitioning of the investigation. So it's important to important to remember that they produce a lot of anxiety. These contacts mm-hmm. to try try to remain calm and give the officer as much as much information as you can, because that allows the officer to piece the situation together and understand what's happening. Excellent. A couple of things. One for our listeners and viewers is Ascend offers uh, cards identifying members being part of the autistic community, which will be uh, available to you, and we'll have that information uh, later on. And secondly, um, if an individual uh, isn't able to control their anxiety and it does escalate, is it possible that that individual, again, on the uh, spectrum, could be charged with resisting arrest? 
There is a there is always that possibility um, when when making charges. You, you, we we have to look at the, mm -hmm. the totality of the circumstances as well, um, and and it would that would be situational. It would be a case by case basis. Um, certainly, that would uh, would play into a factor um, if the individual was arrested or charged with a, a resisting charge. Um, when it when the district attorney would look at that case, um, that certainly, if the individual was on the autism spectrum, that would be part of uh, the decision of whether or mm -hmm. not to even charge that. Um, but there there could be a possibility. That's why uh, communication is is key um, in in understanding um, from the start and then it, uh, of the encounter, um, as well as um, as the encounter goes through to understand the, mm -hmm. the totality of the circumstances. There is a possibility that that, that could happen. Um, it, it really would depend on the severity of the incident mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of whether or not uh, there, was a, there was a charging decision that was made. Okay. Understood. Will, would you take it from there? Uh, sir, how, how, how can someone avoid being a victim of a crime? That's a, that's a great question, Will. Um, Probably the, the, the biggest uh, tip on, on avoiding being a victim is you really want to be uh, aware of your surroundings. So you want to be in areas where um, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of activity, uh, there's light. Um, when, when suspects uh, look for victims uh, to commit crimes, they look for people that are maybe alone, maybe in a quiet area, maybe vulnerable. They don't like witnesses. So certainly um, if you, you know, feel uh, uncomfortable or feel that you might be a victim or somebody's somebody, a victim of a crime or somebody's um, looking to, to harm you or to take something from you, certainly if you could get to an area that's uh, more populated, such as maybe a, a restaurant or a coffee house or someplace where there's a lot of, lot of people around, that's a big help because the, the suspects won't want to be around a place where there's a lot of people, a lot of witnesses uh, to witness that. Um, if you feel uh, uh, threatened, scared, it's important to pick up the phone and call 911 or tell someone to call 911. Um, you don't have to wait to become a victim of a crime uh, to call the police. And don't be afraid to do that. If, if you're in fear, uh, call the police. Have, have the police come out. And, and talk to talk to whoever the individual is. The police will understand and, and figure out what's going on. If no crime's been committed, that's fine. That's what we do. We're there to go out and, and help people to avoid being a victim of a crime. So it's important to call 911. Uh, you know, put yourself in, in areas where there's a lot of people. Um, you want to attract a, a lot of witnesses. Um, it's important to remember um, if you are a victim, you got to you got to try to calm yourself as much as best as you can. Um, it's a it, it's a very obviously traumatic um, uh, experience, and you have to remember when the police come, they're going to ask you a series of questions, and they're going to want to know about the person who did it. So they're going to ask you for a, a description, and the the police are trained to lead you through a series of questions to try to determine a description of a suspect. So they will ask you one by one. Was it a male or was it a female? Um, how, how tall was the person? Um, how, mu how much did they weigh? What race was the person? Um, were they wearing glasses? Did they have short hair or long hair? They'll lead you through those series of questions to try to uh, get as detailed of a description of a suspect as possible. And then they'll ask you other questions. If the person got into a car, they'll ask you questions maybe about the license plate. And it's, it's hard to remember all of these um, uh, descriptions, um, especially when you're under stressful situations. But if you can, you can key in on some, some key characteristics, that's really important and very helpful um, for the officers. And certainly, um, if you have a friend, if you have an advocate, um, if you have a caregiver, um, it would certainly be appropriate to enlist, enlist their help in, in relaying information as well. Thank you. Very valuable information. Let's take a brief break. For our next segment, uh, we'll be joined by our panelist, Stacy Kennedy.
Hi, Officer Moser. I have a few questions here. Uh, what should family members or advocates do if someone is arrested and is in jail? Well, Stacy, uh, if a family member or an advocate uh, is at the scene where the arrest is uh, being made, um, it's important if it is a, a possible and, and appropriate to explain to the officer uh, the situation of the individual who's being arrested. Um, it's important for the officer to know uh, as many facts about uh, the case and the incident as mm -hmm. possible. Um, it's also to, important to know or to ask where the individual is going to be taken um, so they know whether or not uh, the individual is actually going to a police station, is going to a hospital, is going to a county jail. There's different places that, um, uh, that the police officers may, under, under different circumstances, take an individual. It's also important to know um, if the individual is going to be cited and released or booked. Um, and there's a big difference. Um, so officers with certain crimes can issue uh, individuals a citation, a ticket, basically, and release them. They can do that. We do that uh, as much as possible from, the, from out in the field at the scene of the incident. We try to avoid uh, bringing individuals back to uh, police stations as much as possible when we can cite and release from the field. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be a situation where uh, an individual is arrested technically. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're put in the, in the back of a police car, but they're going to be given a ticket. Mm -hmm. and, and when they sign that ticket, they're released, and then uh, they have to appear in, in court at a later date. Mm -hmm. Could be a situation where they're being brought back to a police station and then given a ticket from there and released. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a situation where in, in more serious crimes, where they would be booked at, at county jail. Um, so it's important to know, to ask the, where the individual is going to be taken and if they're going to be cited versus, book, versus being booked, and really to explain the, the situation that's going on with the, with the individual, um, that they do have autism. It's very important to know um, for officers um, in, in making a determination as to where that individual uh, is mm -hmm. going to go to. Mm -hmm. um, th the other uh, thing to note is to tell that individual to call you as soon as they're, as soon as they're able mm -hmm. so they can also explain what, what's going on with their situation once they arrive at whatever facility that they're at. Okay. Um, autistic people are usually are vulnerable and when an autistic person is arrested, how could they be kept safe? In jail. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So, the San Francisco Police Department has very strict uh, guidelines regarding um, individuals with autism or individuals that have uh, a, d a developmental disability. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh, we are not to put any of those individuals into uh, district station holding mm -hmm. cells. Um, they're to be uh, kept out of the holding cells, and they're to be transferred out of the out of the uh, station. So. We don't want to uh, put a situation <coughs> where we have a, an individual um, who's vulnerable um, into a cell or around other individuals that may take advantage of them and, 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 and victimize them. So that's very important uh, for us to know. We keep those individuals um, out of uh, our holding cells. We would call a county jail immediately and tell them um, the situation that we had uh, an individual mm -hmm. Uh, who, who was autistic or who had a developmental disability, um, and then the jail on their end, the county jail, would take their safeguards and measures similar to ours mm -hmm. on their end to make sure that that person's kept safe, safe and separate from anybody that who's going to to victimize that person. Okay. So, um, yeah, there was a question asked earlier. My boyfriend was asking me that if someone was like caught in a crossfire. Um, like he said, he had a concussion and he was pulled over or something. Um, and if he had like no witnesses or any advocates mm -hmm. whatsoever, um, or at least at the time he didn't, um, I suppose what was discussed earlier, is they, they just, you know, um, and um, and be and be, be held somehow until they could think of something or any yeah, sources I, I, to, I that will help? Sure. Um, and and I, I, think, I think the scenario that was, was posted, uh, poised earlier was um, regarding a pat search scenario. And that, that was kind of uh, yeah. explained the, uh, the situation of the, 
uh, searching of the outer clothing um, <laughs> of an individual if an officer suspected that that individual might have uh, a weapon and th that's those those type of situations mm -hmm. um, it, it's important to note that um, if for whatever reason um, you feel that you weren't treated fairly um, mm -hmm. by an officer um, there's there's a couple of things you could do number one is you could always ask for a supervisor or a sergeant to come to the scene mm -hmm. and explain the situation to the sergeant um, and then after the fact if you still don't feel that um, you were treated fairly or you didn't um, you know receive the services that that you felt that you mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. um, we have a, a mechanism here in place uh, in San Francisco that's, that's n uh, called the Office of Citizens Complaints and that's a, uh, a separate uh, civilian review board that basically takes complaints against officers if you feel that you weren't treated fairly or you were mistreated and they investigate those so certainly if, if you feel you were mistreated in any way um, it's important mm -hmm. to know that that's an option um, and we certainly would encourage uh, encourage you to come forward and, and report that to the Office of Citizens Complaints. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, especially I think it's good that, you know, both site, both parties educate themselves like on the autism community, but also how someone on the spectrum should know um, how they should react if they have to have a PAT search. Yep. And I, I think it's great that, you know, each side should educate themselves so they know what to do. I, and, and I think, I think Stacy, you, um, you made a, make a fantastic point. Mm -hmm. um, it is important for both sides to, ha to educate, mm -hmm. and, and that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. um, it's important for our officers to understand uh, the autistic community and how to better interact. It's important for members of the autistic community to understand what the officer's jobs are mm -hmm. and, and um, what they might encounter or experience when they, when they meet officers. And that's really important, and that's what we mm -hmm. really want to work towards to, un to get that mutual, mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Commander Moser. You've provided uh, us with invaluable information, and I understand that uh, well, there may be further interactions between the SFPD and ASCEND. Uh, we are planning at a future meeting to um, have a discussion on the community and uh, financial and other types of scams. We're looking forward to hearing from that. And again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, so for this week's uh, program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum, I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Stacy Kennedy. Commander Bob Moser, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>